Okay, so this is just going to be kind of a super chill video. I just want I felt like it was really important to just kind of talk about why I became a special education teacher. So let's go ahead and get into it. So hi, my name is Rachel um, from the Behavior Check-In. If you're new here, I am a K through two behavior teacher in Florida. Um, I work with students with emotional disabilities. That um, is where my love and my heart is. This has been kind of a tough year to be a teacher. Well, let's be honest. It's been tough to be in education for a while now. There's been a lot of education reform that has not been in the most pro-teacher and pro-student, in my opinion, being made by people who have no business making rules about education, but that is a topic for another video. But it's been kind of hard to sit back and think about your why as why you became a teacher. And I felt like I really needed to sit down and just make this video, even if nobody else out there in the internet cares, I wanted to sit down and express my why because I think I needed to talk about it. You know, I've been scrolling through teacher tech talk and I've had to get myself to stop doing that. I like the funny ones, they make me happy, but I feel like, and I'm probably saying something very controversial here, but I feel like some of the ones where people are leaving um, education is kind of becoming like the new teacher's lounge. And um, at first, you know, I was rooting for everybody, you know, because I think that people need to know that education is hard and what we are going through is not right. And I agree with that and it needs to be said, but it was just filling up my feed and kind of fueling my negative thoughts. So I just stepped back and realized that I kind of just needed to like back away from that. And I really need to sit down and think about my why and why I got into education. Just a little background on me. <laughs> um, I was not always a teacher. I was actually a television news producer. I worked in two television stations prior to having children. And I did that for a couple of years. I worked in Terre Haute, Indiana, and then I worked in Lexington, Kentucky. And I loved my job at first. It was something that I was very passionate about. I'd always wanted to do that. I actually taken a job as a producer um, in hopes of becoming a reporter. And I really fell in love with producing. And um, so I really enjoyed doing what I was doing until I didn't. <laughs> so when I moved to Lexington, Kentucky, I just... I felt like we were always covering crime and negative things, and that's just not who I am as a person. As I just stated, I don't like talking about negative. It like really triggers my anxiety, and it was getting to me. Not to mention, it's not a very active job, and I was having a hard time sitting all day long and writing, and we had the scanner going back in the background, and I had some attention issues. So it was a very stressful environment for me, and I don't really feel like it was a good fit for who I am as a person, because we were talking about death, and destruction and I had all these noises going on and things were constantly changing and you know as I'm learning I, <laughs> I'm i a little bit more like my ADHers than I am like anybody else and it was just not an environment that worked for my anxiety so I knew that it was time for me to move on and I would totally talk about my news experience it's more I'm glossing over it but if you wanted to know more about it or why I left news I will totally do a video on it because um, it's more than just like it was not the best environment for me in terms of my personality there was a lot of different things because um, it really was a career I wanted and was very passionate about but just wasn't for me so when I left I found out that I was going to, I was expecting my son. And it was during the recession and it was really hard to find a job. So I just decided, you know what, I'm going to stay home with him. And that's what I did. And then along came my daughter and my husband joined the military and off we went. And so I stayed home for a while, but I started to get bored. I'm a very busy person. I loved being home with my kids. I felt like it was very rewarding, but I was lonely and I was bored and my husband was an E nothing and we made nothing, no money. So I had to do something. So I started working as a preschool teacher. I always kind of had an interest in early childhood development and got way more interested in it when my um, children were growing up. So I went and taught preschool for a little while. I enjoyed it, but it was only three days a week. So I started substitute teaching and that is where I got the idea that I really wanted to go into education. So long story short, I always kind of thought I wanted to go into education, but 
I, I don't know. It just seemed boring to me at the time. I wanted to chase my dreams of being in television news. So I didn't go into education. But when I was subbing, I actually subbed in a self-contained class with students with intellectual disabilities. And I loved it. I, like, I fell in love. That's what I wanted to do. And everybody told me I was absolutely crazy. Like, don't go into education. Education's horrible. In fact, <laughs> my mother-in-law is a retired teacher and she was strongly advising me not to do it. Um, not because she didn't think I would be a good teacher, but because she had seen the changes of education over that time frame and just felt like it was a very stressful career. But I knew that's where I needed to be. I really truly felt like it was a calling for me. So I took a position as an assistant in that classroom when it became available and I started working on my master's degree in special education. So really, that's kind of the background of how I moved from one career to another. Now let's really talk about like why I wanted to go into education. It wasn't just as simple as I started in this classroom and it all kind of came together. Education had always been something I thought I wanted to do when I was younger. Um, growing up, I was a student with a learning disability and um, so I had an IEP starting like in the first grade uh, for reading and for math. I mean, basically, if it was school, I struggled with it. Um, I have not been diagnosed formally with ADHD, but I'm pretty sure I have it, <laughs> um, especially after all the things that I've learned. Now I've learned a lot of coping strategies throughout my life. So um, I can manage a lot of it. But watching this video, you probably can see some of that too. But I struggled with a lot of those things growing up. School was extremely difficult for me. I really don't even know how I made it sometimes, to be honest. I was just so significantly behind. I could not read. Um, I struggled socially. I struggled academically. Like I just didn't fit in with the kids. I was a high ball of nerves and anxiety, which really didn't help everything. So I needed a lot of support. And school was just it was a challenging place, but the only thing that was really my saving grace was my special education teachers and the support that I received from them. I felt like they really saw me. My general education teachers, I just never felt like they saw me. I felt like they just saw a girl who couldn't read and wasn't very good at math and they just saw the issues that I had. They never saw the human being that I was and they never saw my potential. Whereas I felt like my special education teachers really saw my potential. They saw my room to grow. They saw the person that was inside of me, not just the disability. They saw the ability. And I was very grateful for that. I continued with my IEP through junior high. Junior high was an absolute nightmare. I think it was for most people, but it was definitely for me because um, I struggled with the social settings, um, academics got even harder and I still was probably about two grade levels behind my peers. So junior high was an absolute nightmare. I, they didn't really, the curriculum was based off of what grade you were in. And since I was like about two grade levels behind, I was using math books that were two grade levels behind and my peers would be like, Oh, you have the fifth grade math book and would make comments about it. And it was mortifying. I actually really hated going to my special education classes in junior high um, just because everybody knew that was the special ed room and that was the dumb kid room, which I really, really hate that that was even said. But that was what it was <laughs> perceived as. Now, my teachers and the assistants in the room were absolutely amazing. And I loved just being in there with them and getting the support that they had. Um, and I really am grateful for everything that they taught me. Um, sometimes my special ed teacher that I had could be a little bit hard on me, which would make me upset because I wanted her to like me all the time, but she was being hard to hard on me out of love. I was incredibly disorganized, executive functioning nightmare. And she was always insisting that I write in my planner and I do my homework and she was on it, on it, on it all the time on me. And I felt like she was always picking on me. Honestly, I was frustrated by it. But as a teacher now, I know that she saw that potential in me and she was really trying to push me to grow and grow and grow. And I actually know I was an adult. Um, and, you know, I, I really feel like her tough love really brought me into where I am today. If I had not had someone who 
who refused to coddle me, but push me in a positive way, I would not be where I am today. So for all of you tough as nails teachers who show a lot of tough love, um, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> and let me like add in there too, that she wasn't like mean. She just had very high expectations and she didn't falter on those expectations. And if I needed to be told that I was not meeting those expectations, she didn't sugarcoat it. Like she told me. And I really do appreciate that because that really helped me grow. But moving forward, she had my back. I had her all three years. Um, we were going into, well, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, I had horrible grades, even with like special ed services. I had absolutely horrible grades, pretty much in anything but my special ed classes. And, um, I think that was attributed to the fact that I was very disorganized. We'll <laughs> leave it right there. Um, I also was very afraid to ask for help, very embarrassed by my disabilities. So I didn't ever ask for any help. And um, I was going through some depression and anxiety at that time. Of course, no one was addressing that because it was the 90s and we just didn't talk about children's mental health. And so I missed a lot of school because I was sick. Um, I was having a lot of somatic symptoms from my anxiety. So I was <coughs> sick. Well, I mean, I was mentally sick, to be honest. So it kind of manifested physically. I missed a lot of school that left me behind. Um, I struggled socially with the kids. They were really mean to me. Lots of name calling, um, bullying, and that sort of stuff. So junior high, middle school was a nightmare. I wanted so much to be liked, and I was so far from being liked. <laughs> I, at least, I don't know. Maybe someone who went to school with me might be able to add in there, but I felt like I was pretty much on the bottom of the junior high food chain. So anyway, grades were not good. Future was not looking that great as I enrolled into high school and I met with my guidance counselor. And my guidance counselor was, I don't know what she, I maybe she thought she was a real life realist person, but she squashed my dreams in about 2.5 seconds. So just like a little background information, my mom was, a, well, she's a retired attorney and my dad, you know, he had a college degree. He worked in finance and, you know, my brothers were both extremely bright. My younger brother's like off the wall gifted. <laughs> I mean, I was surrounded by really smart, educated people. So I was like the black sheep, but my parents always still in, always instilled high expectations and goals in me. And they wanted me to well, they didn't want me to. They wanted me to do what I wanted to do, be happy. But I always wanted to go to college because that's what I saw with the people around me. You know, I was really proud of my mom being an attorney and going to law school at a time it was not really common for women to go to law school. And I really wanted to do something like that as well. Um, so I'll just preface, that was a goal of mine. Well, this guidance counselor looked at all of my transcripts and my state test scores and my track record and did what the natural thing would do when you don't know someone and you're just seeing what they look like on paper. And she was like, <laughs> college is not an option for you. And I'd mean no re disrespect to anyone who works in a trade. I, I admire it. Um, there's a lot of things that I couldn't do and your jobs are hundred percent necessary. And honestly, you make more money than I do, but I wanted to go to college. So when she was telling me that I needed to look more for a trade, um, it really upset me <laughs> because if I wanted to do that, I think I would have been on board, but my dream was that I wanted to go off to college. At that time, I actually wanted to be a guidance counselor. So I knew I wanted to go to school for education and that's kind of what I wanted to do. Well, more than kind of, I really knew that's what I wanted to do. And so when she told me that college was never gonna be an option for me, like I just wasn't gonna get in, I just couldn't get through the math, that's what she said, I couldn't get through the classes. And, it was a really heartbreaking experience. And my special education teacher who was coming up with me was my teacher of record. Like she was not happy because she knew my goals and my dreams. And like I said, she knew me for three years. She knew what I was capable of. She just knew that all the pieces in my brain had not come together yet, but it didn't mean that they weren't going to come together. And so she advocated hard for me and that just blew my mind. So this guy's counselor who didn't want to put me and any college prep classes at all I wanted to put me in remedial everything finally listened to her and my mom who stood up and advocated for me too but you could see the look on her face like I'm gonna put you in this but if you start failing 
I'm just you're gonna be out. It's just not gonna happen for you, honey. We'll get you in, you know, doing something else. Well, that lit a fire under my butt. I think <laughs> that experience, realizing that I can't be put out of these classes, and some brain development. <laughs> I think that helped a little too over the summer as well. I did grow up some and I just, I decided, you know, I'm going to prove this woman wrong. I'm going to prove her wrong. And, um, I got put into my freshman English class. It was the lower level English class. And, um, that was an adventure because <laughs> the kids I was in there with would rather have been anywhere else on earth but that English class. And I actually liked English. I just wasn't, I didn't have very good reading comprehension because I really struggled with decoding when I was younger. So all of it was really delayed. Um, but I loved like li listening to the stories. I loved listening to audiobooks. I enjoyed that sort of thing. So I loved the literature. I just wasn't the best reader. Um, at the time. I was a creative storyteller, but my spelling was abysmal, so I wasn't quite the best writer. So I was in that class, and that class, nobody else wanted to be there. Nobody else cared, honestly. Um, they hated English, didn't really like school, and it was kind of a miserable experience. <laughs> and I remember thinking while I was sitting there, I don't want to be in this class with kids who don't care. Like, I've got goals. I want to do other things. So I pushed myself some more and got myself into like the middle of the road English class and then slowly throughout the years worked my way up and actually got into advanced English um, through a lot of hard work and through a lot of advocating from my teacher of records, my special ed teachers that I had who really truly believed in me. Because once again, I didn't have too many gen ed teachers that believed in me. It was pretty much my sped teachers the whole time because I actually had some teachers in high school who didn't want to honor my IEP. Um, I had a science teacher who thought that I, if I had an IEP, I shouldn't even be in his class. Like they had a low level science class that I should be taking. And when I think about it now, it just makes me cringe because I wanted to go to college. That was my overall goal. And when you do IEPs and you make transition plans, you hold the kids goals. Like those are so incredibly important. Now you want to be realistic, but you honor their goals and their dreams because kids work hard for what they want. And to have teachers be like, well, if she has an IP, she shouldn't be in my class. Well, she doesn't need extended time. Um, they're just using that as a crutch. Oh my gosh, there were some other things. Like you're just, yeah, a lot of it you were using it as a crutch was that I got that, an accommodation that I needed because it took me forever to read. I still am an incredibly slow reader, but that's what I need to do to comprehend what I'm doing. <laughs> I need time to focus. I need time to get my anxiety in check. And it just made me mad that some of these teachers thought that they knew better than like the specialists who worked with me and my parents and myself. But I digress on that one. But anyway, so I had thought that I wanted to be a teacher the whole time that I was in school. And um, I had had that plan. I really wanted to be a guidance counselor. And then um, it was kind of like what everybody expected me to do. And I think my way of rebelling was, well, actually, everybody kind of, when I, by the time I got to my senior year, I was getting a little reputation as um, the golden child, I guess, of our special education program. There was a couple other kids who were excelling and doing really well, too. But, you know, they were really proud of us, and I think everybody kind of expected me to go that route. And I decided, you know what, I was kind of sick of being labeled as that special ed girl, so I really didn't want to go into special education. It seemed very predictable. <laughs> so I fought against, I think, my own nature, and that's why I went into some other field. I wanted... I think I wanted to go into journalism because I wanted people to know that I was capable of being more than a special ed girl. And I felt like being on television and working on broadcast news and having a kind of job that looked successful was going to validate me in some way. And that's what I felt like I needed. I had a lot of childhood trauma from having a learning disability growing up. And I hate saying that. Um, 
because there were a lot of amazing people who tried to prevent me from having that trauma, but this was having learning disability in the 90s, and I'm sure it was even worse having learning disability in the 80s or the 70s and all of that. But having a learning disability in the 90s, it was still very stigmatized, and I have a lot of trauma from it <laughs> and a lot of self-esteem issues from it. And when it boiled down to it, and I worked with those students when I started subbing in the classroom, and I realized that I had achieved something that people had not expected of me, even though I only did it for two years and I went on to college and all that stuff. But I felt like I had some sort of value that I, not value, I felt like I had something I could share. I had some inspiration I could share because I remember being in school and you were kind of the kid in sped you, and that was like how everybody saw you. And that begins to be how you see yourself. And I just, really want children to know that they are more than their disability label. You're more than the classroom that you walk into, especially when I teach in a positive behavior support classroom, because my students are more than their struggles with emotional regulation. And I think it's important for people to know that like my students are amazing. <laughs> they are just they just blow me away with like their hearts and how compassionate and silly and funny they are and smart. Oh my gosh. And they don't see how smart they are. And so many people look at students who are in special education and they just put them into a box. And I think, well, I know, I know that's why I became a special education teacher because they need someone in their corner who knows what it feels like. And they know they need someone in their corner who's been there and walked in their shoes. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with special ed teachers who haven't been special ed students. It's they're amazing. It's like saying, you know, teachers who haven't been parents. It's like saying that if you're not a parent, you're not a good teacher. That's not true. There's amazing teachers who were never parents and there's amazing sped teachers who never sped students. But I think when you have that experience of being a special education student and on top of it, I'm a special education parent as well. I have a child with an IEP. It gives you a different insight, an insight that nobody else has. And you can see kind of the past, the present, and the future for your students. And that insight is very, very valuable because they need that advocate because they still are. I mean, even in 2021, we're still judging kids. Now, I don't think we're judging the learning disabilities as much as they were when I was growing up, but the new label is emotionally disabled. That is the bad kid crew. And that makes me so mad. I mean, when I tell people that that's what I teach, they go, Oh God, bless you. No, please stop. Please. Like that's not okay. My students are absolutely amazing. And you know what? I firmly believe my students are going to do great things. Just because we have a learning disability and emotional regulation doesn't mean that we're a bad kid. It just means we need to be taught coping strategies to be able to learn how to manage our really big emotions that are a little too big for us to process at this moment. We're not bad kids. And, you know, I think it's important for my students to know that. And that is truly why I do what I do, is I want my students to know that there is more than what they're going through right now, that they have a big, bright future ahead of them and that I love them and that I'm going to help them get there and that they're going to be successful and that <laughs> this is my why. I love my job. Now, there are days that are hard because there's, there's days that are hard doing anything, but even though I get frustrated and say that I think I'm going to go work at Walmart, I really don't think there's anything else that I would rather do. Now, don't get me wrong. If they want to pay me more or give me more time for prep, I'm all on it because those things would be greatly appreciated and teachers need those. And let me just take a second to thank all of the teacher's assistants that work out there. You all are angels on earth. I have walked in your shoes. It is a thankless, hard job. They pay you nothing, <laughs> nothing. And it's pathetic because I could not do my job without my teacher's assistants. So just keep that in mind. But I would not do anything else. I don't see myself ever doing anything else. I think this is where God want me to, wanted me to be. I'm going to get philosophical about it. I feel like I was called to work with these students. I feel like the experiences that I had growing up 
were very painful and very, very real to me for a reason because I needed to know what it felt like to be in their shoes. And you know, having a child who has those needs as well, and I see that there's so much to that child, my own personal child as well, and I see it from every end, and I know what it's like for my parents, and what <laughs> what what nighttime's like, and bedtime's like, and a homework's like, I really feel it, because I really want to help the parents too. I mean, that's why I created this channel, is I want to help teachers, and parents, and students. I, I want to build a community to, to help us grow and to end the stigma on learning disabilities and end the stigma on mental health. You know, we're all different. People were not meant to be exactly alike. It's our differences that just make this world a great place. But we have to learn to love each other for who we are and accept each other. And we need to learn that people don't learn the same way. And people don't learn in the same learning environments. And people, you know, some people may need to get up and move to learn. And some people may need to sit and have dead silence. And some people may struggle to make friends. And some people may <laughs> struggle to to keep their mood stable and to be happy. Even when it feels like there's everything in the world to be happy about, they can't keep their brain chemistry and happy. It's just important, I think, for people to know that. And that is why I'm a special education teacher because I want to help people and I want to help my students and I want them to be successful because I know they can and I love them and I know I rambled a lot in this video so if you stayed all the way to the end thank you so much I, I really appreciate it if you would like more on my journey I kind of glossed over a lot of it I have some more specific tales um, I retained my IEP all the way through college so if you have questions on that I'm happy to answer and I had to pull out that IEP and I had to use it. If you are a student with a disability and you're feeling like that you're alone and that you can't get through this I just want you to know you're not and I just want you to know that you are capable of great things and that you have a lot to offer. Uh, kids who have to grow up with an IEP work harder than anybody. That conception that you're lazy or that it's an easy way out or it's a cop out, that is so archaic and wrong. Individuals with disabilities, learning disabilities, emotional disabilities, physical disabilities, neurological disabilities, all of them, the whole gamut, you work so incredibly hard every single day to be successful in a world that is not designed for you in mind and you push through the barriers and you are stronger than you know and you are amazing and you are wonderful and you are here for a purpose and I just want you to know that with the bottom of my heart and I wish someone had told me that a long time ago I think it would have saved me a lot of pain um my mom told me that but it was my mom so <laughs> <laughs> I believe her, I love her, but you know, if someone had told me that and someone had shown me that you can do it, I think it would have just meant the world to me. So I really hope this video was helpful. If you liked it, please like, share to anybody you think this might be helpful for. Um, if you're new here, please subscribe to my channel. I would love to have you here as part of my family um, and just a chance to learn and grow together. So until then... I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.